people a few minutes. Thank you so much for being here at 6.30, Karen. We're gonna give folks a few people to, a few people, give folks a few minutes <laughs> to trickle in. We'll see how that bodes for my speaking if I'm already switching words. <laughs> I did have COVID last week, I'm feeling much better. I don't know if I had brain fog. So this will be the ultimate <laughs> test to see if I'm back on my feet. <laughs> well, we're very grateful for PowerPoint, so. <laughs> I feel like you truly am. Yeah. Just look Let's at the PowerPoint. Go. Hi, Julia. Thanks for being here. Hey, Hi, Felicia. Hey. Welcome. We're expecting at least a handful of a few more folks. So we're just going to give people I don't know, so sorry, what do you think? Another four or five minutes? Yeah, I, I do want to have this. I just got a message from, I believe, Martha that was a little. So in the meantime, yeah, please make yourself comfortable. Uh, we'll, we'll do a brief, depending on how many people are here, we'll probably have time to do some introductions. Um, we're going to do the first section of the class and then take like a five minute break about halfway through. Um, and then we'll jump into the second section. Um, so grab some water. Okay, so I'm seeing folks, are, <laughs> folks are beginning to, there's registrations coming in now. So there'll be folks joining in. Okay. And if people need to join a little late, that's okay, but we are gonna get started around 6.35. And I am gonna start class with, um, just a few sounds to set the space. So it's also okay if people trickle in while that's happening. So with your permission, I'll do a very short intro. Mm -hmm. when it's time to start and then I'll be as quiet as I ever am. Just mostly quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried. Thank you. We've been Zooming together for a long time. Yeah, we are long-term long -term Zoomers, you and I, it's true. And I can take the screen down if you wanna do a little intro. Hey there, Julia. And while we're waiting for the next two minutes, I'm sorry, do you mind if I just ask people what brought them here today? Sure. Yeah, so my name is Jocelyn. I'm gonna be teaching tonight's workshop. Um, you're welcome to come off mute and just say your name, where maybe where you're coming in from or, or why you came here today. And I also invite you to share something that gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. I'll go, I'll go first again. My name is Jocelyn. <laughs> I'm a doula, I'm a childbirth educator. And I love teaching about oxytocin because my brain likes to know why I experience things the way I do. And the more I learned about birth, the more I was curious about how um, hormones and neurotransmitters impacted that process. And I learned so much more than just about birth in diving into this topic. And something that gives me warm, fuzzy feelings is in the morning when I start to wake up and my dog scoots up to me and stretches out and rolls on his belly and asks for belly rubs. That gives me warm, fuzzy feelings. I can go next. I'm Julia. I am also a doula. Um, I do both birth and postpartum work and I'm part of Shipper Circle. 
And I think a nice meal is what gives me warm, fuzzy feelings. Um, I like to eat and I like to cook. So sharing a meal with friends um, is the spot for me. That reminds me, you're all welcome to eat or take care of your needs. I know it's dinner time for folks. If we can have folks on camera, that would be really nice since we're a small group and it'd be nice to see each other and connect in that way. And um, as we check in, we can just call on the next person to check in. So again, you're invited to share your name, why you're here tonight. That's something that is warm and fuzzy. All right, I'll go first and I'll put myself on camera. It's about 940 where I live. So you probably can't see me. I'm in the dark. No. Um, <laughs> Good for you. But you. I am Karen and um, I, am a, I am a doula. I'm working on my certification um, with um, SMC. And uh, oxytocin is one of my most favorite topics mm -hmm. um, that... It, like I have so many notes on what you taught um, during my, my training. Um, with, it was just my most favorite thing to the point where it's actually what I talk about first when talking to uh, new moms that I've been working with. Mm -hmm. So when this came up, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm definitely going to be there. So uh, what gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling, I would say waking up at 5 a.m. before everyone else in my house wakes up and just sitting with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Um, I have a little spot where I just look out the window at the trees. That gives me warm, fuzzy feelings every single morning when I'm able to do that. Me too. <laughs> There's something about a spot with a window and a hot cup, particularly that combo, Karen. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> exactly. You want to call on someone else to uh, say hello and check in? Just, yeah, just yeah. pick another person in the group. Uh, let's see, Felicia. I am Felicia, and I've never taken a class that um, directly relates to Oxytocin. So this should be very interesting. I'm going to get my notebook so I can take a lot of notes like our um, sister Karen said. <laughs> um, I believe it was Karen who just said that. Yes. Um, so, and I'm here just to learn more. I'm kind of new to the front um, and I'm just learning what um, this circle is all about. So I'm excited to be here. And uh, was that it? Oh, what makes me warm and fuzzy? Something that makes me warm and fuzzy is, um, I would say on a daily basis, would be waking up and going into my living room and I have like a wall that's pretty much all window. And um, I live in a very nature surrounded, all the elements, the water, the earth, the air, no fire, but thank God. But um, yeah. yeah, so just seeing the elements, every morning when I walk out into my living room and I'm always saying how grateful I am to um, be in the space that I'm at. So I guess you know, it's really, and I'm gonna pass it to Julia. I already talked, but um, I'll pass it on to Martha. Thank you. Hi, ladies. I'm so sorry. Um, I, um, I, I've been focusing on something else. So I only got part of what we're supposed to be telling about right this moment. Um, I was actually responding to Simsara telling me that my client was not completely in labor. Um, and Simsara, what I was about to tell you, I'm sorry, ladies, all off topic was we're waiting for dad to come home. Labor just started. First baby, super nervous mommy. Um, and, um, dad is on his way home to do some of this process. So I will not be here all evening, all night. 
I realize she's not in full active labor, but she is very, very nervous. That's um, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's very kind of you. No, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, I am here because Jocelyn, I was going to, um, I was going to read up on some oxytocin stuff. So when you said you were going to be talking about oxytocin, I was kind of excited. Um, and what gives me warm and fuzzy feelings is getting up in the morning and getting my kids uh, to school on time. <laughs> because, <laughs> because they go to school an hour, almost an hour away. And sometimes it's hard for us. So what makes me the happiest? Oh, and sorry. Uh, she also has a, a, a two-year-old that she is in the background. Um, so, um, and she, her foster baby or her foster adopted child is in the background. So just in case you guys hear baby. Um, but um, what gives me warm fuzzy feelings is getting my kids to school on time and having a productive day that doesn't drive me crazy and give me a headache. Um, and being able to be here with you guys. That's what definitely gives me warm fuzzy feelings and makes me excited on Tuesdays is that I get to come in and hear so much information um, and just be with people that are thinking like I'm thinking and learning from people who know a little bit more than me and are willing to teach um, so openly and so willingly. And I don't know if I missed anybody to call or if anybody else needs to speak. Thank you. Looks like Priscilla is coming in. Um, hi, Ms. Priscilla. Hey. You're welcome to uh, introduce yourself and why you're here tonight and something that gives you the warm, fuzzy feelings. And then we'll probably segue to Samsara's intro and get started. Good. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm sorry. I am off camera, but it is burning up in my room. So <laughs> I'm a little indecent at the moment. But uh, what brings me here is because I always love to hear you and hear you teach jazz. You're awesome. And something that gives me warm fuzzy feelings is baby. You want baby so cute. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> They're all good ones. Hello, everyone. My name is Elise Shiva, or Lalisa is my birth name. Um, I'm a doula, and I just finished my hypnobirthing class. I don't know if you can see me because of my background. Um, I just finished my hypnobirthing class. I'm in the process of trying to certify for my SMC doula and my hypnobirthing, so I'm pretty busy. Um, what gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling is my family. Um, Sister Simshar is my witness. I have pictures everywhere from everybody that's been graduating the last few weeks, so my children and my grandbabies are give me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Thank you, Shaver. Thank you for being here. So, my turn. So, um, I am Samsara Morgan. I'm the executive director of the Open Better Birth Foundation. And uh, we are really happy and proud to be co presenting this wonderful time of information and uplift with uh, Jocelyn Ballerano, who is a Schiffer Circle doula and an SMC doula and a lot of other things that she'll tell us about. I'm very, very proud to work with this birth worker and see her progress through the years. She was a little baby doula, but she's all growing up. She's not, she's almost all grown up. That's her. I'm very proud of her and I'm really excited about the work that she's done around this amazing hormone um, and uh, she's given this talk before and every time the conversation gets deeper and richer and um, it's an indication of her growth as a person and birth worker so it's fabulous what makes me feel warm and fuzzy is what happened earlier today which is i got to have brunch with my offspring I, I was with my sons and daughter-in-law and our breakfast that was supposed to be, you know, two hours ended up being the majority of the day because we just like each other. <laughs> and we just spent all this wonderful time bonding and connecting. And, and as they left, I was feeling happy and sad. That's really happy that I had made the majority of these people. 
which is really kind of cool when you think about it. And the joy they bring me uh, and uh, my ability to have connections with them that I don't have with any other human beings on the planet. So children, yay. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessalyn. Thank you, Mami C. Samsara. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, if you're here for all about oxytocin, you're in the right place. Um, as mentioned, I'm an SMC doula. I work with Shift for Circle as well, even though I'm now living in Eugene, Oregon, which is land traditionally stewarded by the Kalapuya people. Um, so I'm just taking a moment to thank them and thank my family and my lineage and thank all the people who've allowed my life to unfold as it has, including my Macy Samsara and everyone here in Circle tonight. Um, and I invite you to get comfortable. Uh, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna have the first half of the class, a quick break, and then the second section. Um, I wanted to open actually with a few sounds because I recently started a sound bath training um, because we use sounds in labor and birth, um, in family life. <laughs> um, for those people who are parents, sound is certainly a big part of that. Um, and not so much just thinking about music, but thinking about tones and frequencies and how even the space of the home birth or the hospital or the clinic can really impact um, the energy of the space. So I invite you to close your eyes for just a moment. I'm gonna play three different sounds. I'm going to play four different sounds actually. My mother's a drummer, so I'm gonna play just a few heartbeats on a drum. I'm going to play a Japanese style Rin metal bowl. I'm going to play a crystal bowl and those are in a D and a F, which uh, are frequencies of the sacral and the heart chakras. And I'm gonna play two chimes. So it's not a song, it's just a space that I'm using to set this space between all of us as a little bit separate from that outside world with our phones and television and traffic and all of those things. Um, so you're welcome to close your eyes. It will be just a moment of sound to open the space. Welcome to open your eyes. I don't know if you could hear all of that, but hopefully some of it came through the speakers. And we're going to jump right in. So this, as Samsara mentioned, this is a class we've presented with Oakland Better Birth, through Oakland Better Birth a few times. It's always really an honor to do this, particularly when we get to do it in the spring and the summer when the babies are out and the the blooms are blooming. Um, 
And we're gonna talk through a few different objectives just so you get a sense of what to expect. Um, so I have some like minimum goals for all of you as participants tonight and for myself. Um, hopefully you'll be able to describe oxytocin by the end of class and just a few of its roles in the body, if not all of them, there's quite a few. Uh, name some examples of how oxytocin functions in everyday life. Understand some of the primary roles of oxytocin specifically in childbirth. And we have a lot of doulas here tonight. Um, so this will be a major part of the, the second section. Appreciate oxytocin as a unique and powerful component of mammalian behavior. So not just for humans, but for all mammals. Um, I hope that this class, I know we had some folks who are already interested in oxytocin, hopefully this expands that. And if you're new to oxytocin, maybe this will open a doorway to more learning. Um, I hope also that we'll be able to connect physiology, our anatomy and our feelings um, in concepts of birth and illness and healing. So what's going on with our body? What's going on with our heart? What's going on with our emotions? Feel some of that and see some of that connection between those two uh, seemingly disparate worlds if you ask the medical model. Um, so some of my personal goals for today's class are to get people fired up about their outlook on their own health, on their body, on their relationships. I really see oxytocin as this like magical key to so many things around uh, stress management, longevity, relationships, mental health, etc. Highlight maybe some solutions to the public health crisis we are currently facing around healthcare, education, reproduction. I would add mental health to that as well. Hopefully I'll be able to contribute to some trauma-informed views of birth advocacy. And we will be talking about when birth is challenging, but mostly I wanna just create space and compassion for people's different experiences of oxytocin. Um, and as we learn about the functions, I invite you to reflect on how this aspect of our physiology and our cognition might play out in different relationships. And when those relationships are healthy and positive, it might play out very differently than when there is a relationship that is imbalanced or abusive. And I also hope to uplift through this work and through all of my work, the midwifery model of care is one of the most evidence-based modalities of medicine ever and inspire questions about how and why things are done the way they are. So, you may be familiar with oxytocin. Some of you have uh, encountered it in the SMC training. Um, maybe you've seen it as the hormone of love, um, of consensual wanted sex, uh, breastfeeding, birth, romance, attachment to our children, to our partners, to our family, bonding between friends, between lovers, between kin. All of these activities can be considered functions that nurture the life of social mammals. So obviously we can experience these things in their own categories to some extent, um, but when we're looking at the evolutionary scale, all of these things exist in order to continue the threads of life. Um, so it's really so much more than the love hormone or um, the bonding hormone, it's really about the connective energies between kinships, between communities, between parent and child, between friends. Um, and that is bonding and that is love, um, but it's also about the continuation of the species. So I think a good way to frame, as with so many things, is to start with a question. Um, and the question I have here on the screen, how do we practice belonging? So I'm really just actually gonna invite people to popcorn and like throw an answer out if they wanna put it in the chat or just come off mic really quickly. What's maybe an example of how we would practice belonging in history? And if I don't see someone come on, I can give an example. This could be between community members, between spouses. Any ideas? I'm walking from my village down the river to your village. How might I be welcomed or um, how might we practice belonging in that scenario? Mm 
you think other things that you take a look? It would be uh, folks can speak out so we can hear you. Um, learning on the other person's or the other group of people's ways, their food, um, how they dress. Um, learning, learning their legacy, learning from their legacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sharing story, sharing meals, sharing practices that are familiar in that culture. Um, if I, if you were my guest, maybe just at home, we can even take out the historical context. And you came to my door and you came inside. How might I I show that you were welcome and that you were a part of my my home welcoming friendship space? A smile. Um, a, a greeting hug. Some people hug. Um, a touch. Some people may touch you on your shoulder, and, and you know, the energy between two people when you come through somebody's door. Um. Yep, absolutely. I might offer a cool glass of water. I might offer a hot meal. That's a big one. And meals were on everyone's <laughs> lists. There are a lot of our lists around what gives the warm fuzzies. And in our family, we see those kinds of practices too. So whether we're looking at grand cultural traditions, somebody travels from one place in the world to another and they're invited to sit down and eat a meal um, in the home, you're invited to come have a drink, have a meal with me. Um, Alicia Ava sh shared, maybe, maybe there's physical touch, maybe there's a facial expression, such as a smile. Um, depending on the culture, there might be eye contact um, in the family that's extended into like a slightly more intimate zone. So maybe more touch, maybe more physical closeness, maybe different kinds of facial expressions. So there's these, these kind of human behaviors where the details might vary a little bit, um, but we practice these aspects of, of belonging. And a lot of these are based in the community and the kinship knitting that happens with what we think of as social behavior, but in the brain, is moderated in part by oxytocin. So here we have a beautiful couple staring into each other's eyes. I don't know if these are models or the real deal, but they've convinced me. They're smiling, there's touch happening, they're holding each other's chest and head. Um, they're making eye contact. And eye contact is one of the, um, one of the primary modes of oxytocin stimulation in the brain. Um, I mentioned some cultures, maybe eye contact isn't something done between acquaintances and maybe that's because it's intimate, right? So maybe in some cultures, eye contact is saved for the more intimate relationships and in other cultures, it's expected between friends or acquaintances or neighbors. So again, there's always gonna be some cultural difference there. Um, but regardless of the cultural expectation, the act of eye contact stimulates oxytocin in the brain. When I first encountered oxytocin, I was taking a sociology class in college and I saw an image very much like this one. And you can see here that this is a person chest feeding and they are looking down at their baby who is latched on at the breast. And there's some prolactin going on for milk production. There's some oxytocin, which is responsible for injecting the milk. Um, and there's a positive feedback loop happening where the baby's really happy. You can't really see in this picture, but the baby looks up at the parent. Oh, thank you for feeding me this delicious warm milk. And that eye contact with the parent creates more oxytocin and that oxytocin ejects more milk. And the, ba and the, and the both the baby and the parent feel that sense of belonging and well-being and, and connection. And we'll go into a little bit of the difference between the physiological impacts of oxytocin, such as ejecting milk, and the more psychological impacts, such as that feeling of well-being and connection. Um, I do want to point out in breastfeeding, in chest feeding, oxytocin is responsible for milk ejection. It squeezes these little, um, the milk ducts in the breast tissue, and that ejects the milk. That idea of squeezing is a good way to think about oxytocin and its function. I think of it as the hugging hormone. Like Alicia was said, maybe there's a hugging at the door. So we'll see that oxytocin hugs those milk ducts to squeeze out milk. Oxytocin helps the uterus hug the baby when birth is happening with a contraction. 
oxytocin hugs the uterus or even penile tissue, the penis, um, at orgasm in sexuality. So there's a hugging, there's a contracting of that tissue. Um, and then the actual behavior of hugging, um, the different yeah, behaviors yeah, that yeah. connect. So the <laughs> eye contact, the touch, the skin to skin, these are all related to oxytocin. So when I saw this picture in college, I was really in a class where I was learning and very excited about this idea that nurture is a part of our evolutionary legacy. And there was a long period where we only ever heard about Darwin and social theory and evolution theory as survival of the fittest. And in a lot of people's brains that brings up this, this image of like, you know, the strongest ape or the largest crocodile, the biggest, baddest animal in that turf being the dominant one and that being the one that survived and went on to reproduce and make more of itself. But we've actually learned the more we understand about biology and evolutionary history, and not just humans, but all animals, is that survival of the fittest mm -hmm. is actually really yeah. going to be determined by how that animal works within its niche, within its community. And for mammals, we're social. We're inherently social animals. We live in community, we learn, we exchange culture, and whatever our culture is, we learn from the generation before us. And so nurturing, baby, being able to nurture one another, being able to nurture offspring, that social exchange is a big part of survival of the fittest when it comes to social species like humans. Um, here's another beautiful image by artist Alex Gray, and it's very anatomical, but also showing that deep eye connection and the feedback loop between the brains and the bodies of the infant and the caregiver. Having access to this the nurturing social aspect, it's a part of our cognition, it's a part of how our bodies work, and it's also part of our greater social unit. Well, part of the core of having this was very, I um, think somebody's, maybe it's, somebody's um, off mute and there's a lot of background noise. If you could please mute yourself. Um, this is a great way for thinking about why chest feeding and lactation and breastfeeding can be difficult sometimes. So I don't know if anyone here is a lactation educator or consultant. A lot of the times as doulas, we do lactation support. Why might breastfeeding be challenging? Well, if you think about survival of the fittest as needing to include social nurturing, care and learning, that means that it must include collaboration, and social learning to nurture our physiological capacities and that there must be mutual support between kin and community members. So when you take somebody's um, first couple days, weeks of lactation and they're not getting support, they're not getting loving care, nurturing touch, um, they're not being helped to learn the skill, which is yes, quote unquote natural, but also very much a learned skill. When they aren't receiving that nurturing from their community, whether it's a helpful doula or a lactation professional or someone in the family who's encouraging and supportive and just trust them to be able to figure it out with some help, it might be difficult to, to lactate and have baby latch effectively. Um, and we often take the, the fastest route in our culture. So if it's hard the first time, instead of kind of sticking with that learning curve and getting the nurturing, getting the cheerleader in our family to help us through that process or having someone come in, if, if people are kind of being impatient with us or they're being discouraging, they don't have the information, they didn't get to do it themselves, which of course we can go into history and racism and some of the intergenerational trauma that has led to that lack of information. If that nurturing and that learning isn't there, it can be difficult. There's a certain beauty to the fact that it's difficult because what that says about evolution is we're supposed to do this together. We're not supposed to do this alone. We're supposed to have support. And whatever you believe about creation and evolution, nature didn't make humans thinking, okay, well, the dairy industry is gonna be making formula, so we don't need to figure this out. They fig we figured it out as mammals and we figured it out with each other and with help and with help from other mammals 
in our kinship group, other human mammals who had done it before us. And they helped us figure out how to get the milk out of our breast into our baby's body. So there's a certain beauty to why that can be challenging. It does not justify that people are left without support, without good information, without consistent care to achieve that if that's, some, if that's something that they wanna do with their child in terms of infant nourishment. Let's pause in case there's any questions. Looks like a few more people come in. Nice to see you, Kathleen. So coming back to some of these main things, you guys actually all mentioned a lot of these. Um, Karen mentioned hot tea in the morning. Felicia mentioned her window is full of beautiful nature. Julia also mentioned eating a meal. Samsara was eating with their family earlier. Um, Martha is with a client, but was expressing the relief of successfully managing her children, getting them to school. Priscilla mentioned babies. Ellie Shaver mentioned um, her family, her loved ones, and all the photos she has. All of those actually relate to some of these functions of how we can stimulate oxytocin in some way or another. So we've talked about eye contact a little bit. Um, food is a big one, and so is heat. So specifically, warm food in the belly can elicit oxytocin. And when you think about the slide I was just looking at, what does that remind us of? Warm milk in the belly, warm milk in the mouth, warm milk in the belly, that stimulates oxytocin for the infant, excuse me. So for an adult, a warm meal in the belly can stimulate oxytocin and even more so when accompanied by community members, whether that is hopefully, you know, in person. And I know that over the last couple of years, that can be, that's been challenging for some folks, but even being in a Zoom call, eating our dinner together is still some social companionship with hot food in the belly. That can, that can be a social aspect of that oxytocin production. Um, I want to come back to Martha's warm fuzzy because she talked about getting, getting the kids to school. And we're going to talk about the central nervous system a little bit and the different ways that it functions, because I think that was a really interesting warm fuzzy. Um, because sometimes the warm fuzzies is this relaxed, uh, at pace kind of home base state. And sometimes the warm fuzzies is relief from whatever the task at hand is, whether that's something that's just a part of your regular day or a specific stressor or something that might be considered an obstacle and props to you, mama, because an hour drive in the morning sounds like a bit of an obstacle that you get through each day. Um, as I mentioned, especially lately, but even in our modern world, not everyone is experiencing this kind of communal contact, um, sense of belonging. We have a lot of anxiety, isolation. Um, people have been socially distanced for a long time. I'm particularly interested in thinking about young people who didn't Maybe, maybe they missed out on a year or more of school with their, with their peers. Um, even before the pandemic hit though, we know that social media usage, and I'm not blaming social media itself, but our attachments and um, expectations of being on our device has sometimes led to a lack of social connection in the lived present physical moment. And I was joking with Samsara earlier that we've done a lot of Zooms together. We used to meet in person on Tuesdays and I pray that that can someday continue for Shift for Circle members. Um, when I started studying oxytocin, I drastically changed my screen time and my screen usage. That was a part of my overall goals anyway, but the more I thought about how I was connecting with my partner and myself on a day-to-day -day basis, the more I wanted to get this kind of image out of my life. And so one thing I started doing is we, we sit down and we eat either lunch or dinner at the table, away from the television, away from our phones, sitting next to each other, chatting, making eye contact, eating together, because that is so much more nourishing to our relationship and our connection with oxytocin and each other than what can sometimes happen, which is, I mean, we've all seen it, We've all probably done it. I'm not calling anyone out. Or you're at a brunch or at the park or walking with your family and three out of four people are on their phones. Um, and I, I say that, like, I love this little, this little computer. It does so much for me, but I don't love it the way I love my partner. 
And I don't love it the way I love some summer when I can go sit on her porch and we can chat in the sun when it's actually warm enough to do that. It's not the same as us texting. Um, so this is a real thing that we're facing as society. And I hope that some of today's learnings, um, especially as we get into more about the actual central nervous system function, can help all of us to feel a little bit more empowered to take a pause and think about where are we connecting with ourselves and other people and where are we um, kind of taking a substitute that doesn't actually have the same cognitive and hormonal effects. Um, so, oops, excuse me. So yeah, isolation is real, um, but we can move past it. And sometimes it comes down to um, small everyday choices. And I think parents are really truly the makers of so much. And I don't say that to put weight or stress on parents. I think parents know this, that being responsible for nurturing a little human being is a really hard job with lots of rewards and lots of challenges. Um, but I mentioned, you know, the family's walking, three out of four people are on their phone. Um, Sometimes I see people walking their baby out and I can't, I don't, I don't know what I will be like when I'm a parent, but I hope that when I'm walking that baby in that carriage, or if I'm walking with them, holding them, that I'm interacting with them and experiencing the world with them, because there's something to be said for taking that pause to make eye contact with your child. This is another um, image by Alex Gray. It's a kid with a boo-boo on their hand. And the parent is giving the boo-boo a kiss and making direct eye contact with the child. And that eye contact is stimulating oxytocin, which stimulates the rest and digest and heal part of the body. It also, in this trusted parent-child relationship, evokes that feeling of safety, belonging, trust, connection. And we know that sometimes when there's a little boo-boo, that's really what the kiddo needs more than anything else. So taking those pauses, even on a hurried rush day, even if you've got that long commute, taking that half a second to make eye contact with kiddo when you say, bye, I love you, have a great day. That can make a really big, big difference on their actual brain and how they function with you, how they function with one another, how they relate to their peers, um, and that you become this and are and maintain being this, this safe and trusted connection as their parent ongoing. Um, it's such an honor and a gift to have that role. Um, and I hope oxytocin can empower people who are in that role to feel even more powerful because it is a superpower in my opinion that we all have, thankfully. Um, so just going into a little bit of definition, the image on the right is really just for vague reference. Don't take, you don't need to take notes on it or anything. Um, but oxytocin is a hormone. That means that it's released by endocrine glands. So the picture on the right shows some of those endocrine glands. You see the pituitary gland, the stomach releases hormones, the pancreas, the uterus. Um, these endocrine glands release hormones. Sometimes the brain does too, and they go into the bloodstream. And then they act on an organ or a function in the body, somewhere else in the body. So you can consider a hormone to be a long distance chemical messenger which is interesting, right? Like if you look at this picture, you'll see at the bottom right, we have ovary and placenta and uterus. Even though we know oxytocin is a big part of birth, the uterus is not producing oxytocin. Oxytocin is being produced actually up in the pituitary gland in the brain and uh, being released and sent to the uterus. The uterus has receptors for oxytocin that are fit just for oxytocin and they receive the oxytocin and that impacts the, the muscular mechanism of the uterus, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so a hormone is a long distance actor, okay? Um, another good example is the adrenal glands, adrenaline. But when you feel adrenaline, when you feel fear, you're not thinking, oh, my kidneys are scared. My adrenals are scared. You're thinking, I feel scared in my chest and my brain and my heart and my emotions. So thinking about hormones, it's they, they happen at all different parts of the body and they affect different parts of the body, which is really interesting, I think. Hormones are also involved in involuntary actions and they tend to be longer term shift in, you know, over cycles, over weeks, over days, over months, over lifetimes. So when I was entering puberty, 
and I was 12 and I was acting like a brat and the period between when I first got my started menstruating and when I matured into an adult by the, I think it's 27 now I think the brain stops maturing I was having hormones unfold over the entire course of that time into the pattern that I am now currently having at the age of 34 um, in terms of my reproduction so these hormones are going to shift over the course of a lifetime. They're going to shift um, for menstruating people over the course of the month. For people assigned male at birth, um, their testosterone hormones cycle within a day, I believe. So there's all these different cycles. And you can really think of hormones as long-term actors for involuntary actions. Like I don't choose when I start menstruating as convenient as that would be. It just happens with my hormones. Oxytocin is a hormone. It is also a neurotransmitter, which is kind of cool because not every chemical messenger in the body is both. As a neurotransmitter, oxytocin is released in the brain and it's utilized locally by the nervous system. So between neurons in the brain and in the rest of the central nervous system. That's what a neurotransmitter does. It generally acts fast or instantaneously or over very short periods of time. So I'm in the woods, a bear comes, cortisol gets released, stress response, I fight or flight or freeze. I think with a bear, you're supposed to like not move. <laughs> um, but that's an instant, instant kind of activity. Um, it acts pretty locally. So again, usually it's happening in the brain and functioning in the brain or in the central nervous system. Um, and it's involved with both voluntary and involuntary actions. Um, but some neurotransmitters are gonna act like hormones and some are gonna act, some hormones are gonna act like neurotransmitters. So don't worry too much about like, do I always know the difference of which is which? These are just some of the ways that chemical messengers act in the body. So one more time, the hormones are in endocrine glands. They tend to be long distance. They tend to be involuntary. They tend to be long-term neurotransmitters tend to happen rapidly and they're mostly taking place in the brain. They tend to be more local in terms of where they impact you um, and they're involved in both voluntary and involuntary behaviors. And as we learn more research, it shows more and more that there's overlap between hormones and neurotransmitters. Like we've learned recently that the gut creates a lot of neurotransmitters such as um, serotonin, dopamine. It's responsible for some of those um, feel good hormones and mental health moderators that we used to think only occurred in the brain. So just a reminder, this is for all mammals. So we have a baby monkey here and their little one, they're practicing some skin to skin touch. Um, Mama's also kind of in like a protective uh, look as far as I can tell, maybe she doesn't like the photographer, I don't blame her. It's also a reminder that um, in the mammalian system, when we think about oxytocin as this nurturing hormone between a parent and child or between other close kin, it can have a protective effect, almost like a mama bear kind of vibe. So my oxytocin can make me feel really lovey-dovey. It can make me feel really connected to my baby, connected to my partner, connected to my doula. If somebody comes in and starts taking photos without my consent, it can also make me feel very protective, okay? So I think that's important to remember that not just the warm, fuzzy feelings are a part of nurturing. There's also that fierceness of protecting the kin group, protecting the safety of the connection, protecting those who are vulnerable within your kin group. I think this picture kind of starts to get at that a little bit. Um, but oxytocin is for every body, which is so much fun, so cool. Uh, whether you are assigned female, male, or intersex, if you're a mammal, you make oxytocin. If you are a baby, a child, an adult, an elder, you make oxytocin. Levels of oxytocin may shift over the course of your lifetime, but it's for every age. Whether or not you're reproducing, it is available within that family unit, just like these two monkeys. It's available within an intimate unit, such as a couple. It's also available in a larger social unit. So if you've ever been at a concert and it's your favorite artist and the beat drops and everyone is screaming and smiling and all your friends look at each other with a big smile on your face, 
you're sharing some oxytocin in that eye contact and in that shared experience and in that sense of belonging and well-being. Oxytocin ensures the protection and nourishment and teaching of offspring. So it's related to this nurturing piece. It's related to the social learning. And as I mentioned, the protective aspect as well. It does peak, as I said, at certain points in the life cycle. So puberty, fertility, uh, sexual activity, pregnancy and gestation, labor, birth, breastfeeding. And because of this, people with bodies assigned female at birth do tend to have more oxytocin peaks by way of their physiological reproduction than somebody assigned male at birth. But people who identify as men and people assigned male at birth can also have plenty of oxytocin and they can stimulate it in very similar ways as somebody who is assigned female but not reproducing. Um, oxytocin also includes neurodivergent people, um, which is wonderful because we, we've also been learning a lot about um, people who are experiencing some, some, some place on the spectrum of autism, um, which can impact people's sense of um, emotional cues and facial recognition in terms of facial expressions. And they've done some really interesting studies with adult men who had autism. And I'm going to say men or women if I'm referring to science that used that term. Um, so this was research on people who identified as men or were identified as men. And they took nasal sprays of oxytocin and they were actually able to perform better on facial cue rec uh, like recognition and, and emotional intelligence, for lack of a better phrase. Um, for up to six weeks after the dosage. So that has some interesting implications for people dealing with neurodivergence of that sort. <clears throat> Excuse me, categories of impact in humans. So we've established that oxytocin is for everybody. What does it do for us? Um, we've started to touch on some of the physiological mechanisms of reproduction, recognition and bonding. So that familiarity and the closeness we feel with those who are familiar. Sense of well-being, that's a big one. That's a huge one. Calm and trust. So not just connection, but also that sense of safety and calm and trust with somebody who you are connected to and also feel uh, this sense of social bond with. Pain reduction, good one for doulas to know about, good one for really anyone to know about. Uh, stress reduction. And that has to do partially with our central nervous system and kind of the few different modes it can enact in. Uh, oxytocin is definitely part of the rest and calm system as opposed to stress. It can lower our pulse and our blood pressure. Um, it can encourage, because it's in the restful state of the body, growth, regeneration, and healing. It decreases fear, um, which can be positive and can also be tricky, right? If you go out and someone is schmoozing you, making deep eye contact, stroking your wrist, making you a nice hot steak dinner, you might start to trust them. We see this in business deals. We see this in dating. Hopefully that business deal and that date goes well, but sometimes people use these, whether they know about oxytocin or not, they use these quote unquote grooming techniques um, as an art of seduction, which can be a positive income, right? But it could outcome, but it can also be a negative outcome if that person is not actually trustworthy, if that person is not actually safe. And so we'll come back to that one in just a minute. Um, improves social interaction, allows for more group cohesion. So in a group where people are feeling higher levels of oxytocin, they're more likely to collaborate. Um, emotional interpretation, which is part of that social interaction. Interoreceptivity, which is mind-body awareness, the, the mental sense of what is happening in your body, whether or not you can articulate it. And we know that this is actually quite high for pregnant and gestating people. Um, the amount of oxytocin in their body increases over the course of pregnancy. And although a pregnant person might not always have the words for it, a lot of times they have what we think of as a pregnant sixth sense or an intuition about something going on in their body. And that is because oxytocin is understood to increase mind-body awareness. Digestion and metabolism. That's a big one too. That's part of that restful growth, healing, regenerative state of the central nervous system. Oxytocin supports healthy digestion and metabolism. 
And then for uh, people identified as breastfeeding women, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease, arthritis, and cancer. That's pretty rad. So I do want to just come back briefly to what I said about the decreasing fear one. I think it's important to always invite learning around trauma-informed work. So when we're thinking about oxytocin and how it functions in our own lives or those of people we care for, or those we love, we have to recognize that we haven't all always experienced positive bonds, meaning we might have experienced social bonding with somebody who was not safe for us. And that could have been a romantic partner, that could have been a parent figure, that could have been a teacher or an authority figure somewhere. If we've experienced a trauma, or especially if we've experienced repeated traumas, the experience of that social bond might be associated with negative outcomes like violence or emotional violence or even sexual assault. And when oxytocin is paired with a violation, which includes not just whatever the act is, but also all the fear and the stress that comes with that, it can, be, it can kind of create some crossed wires in that person's central nervous system where knowing how to discern what is safe and what's not can become challenging or the person might come to associate that conflict arousal of that violence or of that abuse with the social bond. And I'll say I have repeated dramatic, dramatic relationship patterns at times. There was a time where I was repeating very dramatic relationship patterns um, for, with my first boyfriend being an abusive boyfriend. We were 14, 15 years old, but he had an abusive parent and he was abusive towards me. And to me, I thought that was like this romantic love, right? So hopefully this is resonating with, some, I don't hope it resonates, but I understand it might resonate with some folks where that sense of connection and belonging, A, it might come with some other feelings based on the patterns we've experienced in our lives. And B, it might be hard to trust that feeling. It might be hard to say, yes, I am open to this connection or the vulnerability of intimacy or feeling these feelings of well being and trust and calm if that's something that in the past you couldn't actually trust. And I don't want to just leave it there. I want to say there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of solutions for recovering from that type of trauma. Um, and a lot of it actually has to do with teaching our body how to go into an oxytocin-induced state or a calm, restful state and make that place safe for us. And so somatic practices like EFT, um, therapies like EMDR, there's a couple different modalities out there and, and trauma-informed therapy is becoming more popular, thankfully, um, as far as learning to almost like re-expose ourselves to social connection and well-being in a way that is uh, safe and sustainable for our health and our well-being going forward. And sometimes it takes, you know, working with professionals, sometimes it takes a, a lifetime, um, but I do want to put that out there um, for all of us that it's not always so black and white that social connection is good or that um, oxytocin creates feelings that we want to have. So on that note, I do wanna evoke some feelings we all want to have, which is these cute pictures here. I learned from a wonderful birth educator named Karen Strange that's important to put de-stressing photos in your presentation. So this little baby is getting some oxytocin cuddling with the dog. The dog is getting oxytocin cuddling with the baby. This little girl is getting some oxytocin kissing her little sibling and vice versa. Um, so again, even between mammals, we can share oxytocin. Um, through physical touch, through cuddling, uh, through safe contact. Um, and I would like to just invite us to take a short break now, and then we'll jump more into oxytocin in labor and birth. Before we do, does anyone have any questions? And then we'll take five minutes. Okay, we'll see you in five minutes. Five minutes. 
We have one more minute left and then we'll jump back in. But if anyone has any, excuse me, questions or anything they want to uh, bring up before we jump in. And I'm not an endocrinologist. So if you have a question that's super detailed, I can definitely um, you know, recommend some books or follow up with you if it's something outside of my knowledge or scope. Uh, I will share a few authors in the chat as we go. Okay. So we're gonna jump back in. Hi, thank you for letting me know, Alicia, I appreciate that. Hopefully folks are back if you wanna come off screen or just pop on so we know, but we are gonna to return to the presentation. Hi, Kathy, good to see your face. Um, so we left off with kind of a heavy topic, um, but this is life. And I think it's important that we touch on the way these things are truly impacting people. Does anyone have anything they wanted to ask or share before we move on to the next section? Okay. So we're actually gonna jump into some more about oxytocin in labor and birth. And um, we're gonna come back. There's three points here, but I wanna look at the first one. Um, we're gonna come back to oxytocin activity around interval reception or that idea of mind-body awareness um, and the uterine receptors, which we'll look at in a few images. We'll also talk a little bit about contractions um, and a, an example that a lot of doulas are very familiar with is the Ferguson reflex. reflex. Um, but before we do that, I'm gonna share my screen to this video of Dr. Amali Lukogamaje. She's an OBGYN who was within the medical model. And she had a very transformative experience as a pregnant person. And she's since then become an advocate for non-interrupted physiological birth in part because of how powerful the experience of oxytocin was for her. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. And this is a five minute video. Well, I am an obstetrician and gynecologist, um, and I've been one for about 20 years. Um, I've also uh, got a master's in epidemiology, um, because I was very interested in science. Um, and also I've got a doctorate looking at a, a drug that helps to contract the womb in labor and delivery. How, however, my views on pregnancy and childbirth were uh, transformed by my own pregnancy and the birth of my son. Um, I thought after 20 years of obstetric knowledge that I knew most everything and I, I was a teacher for young and new doctors. Um, however, it was a humbling experience to be pregnant. Um, first of all, um, I suppose it enhanced my understanding of the humanistic side of labour and delivery. Um, it made me aware of the profound influence of communicating um, to my baby and my baby communicating with me, uh, a sort of wordless communication. Um, in a scientific paradigm, I might say that it's chemicals or neurochemicals wafting between the two of us. But nevertheless, a dynamic and a conversation was set up between myself and the baby. And this dynamic uh, led me through a very unpredictable course of pregnancy. Uh, first of all, um, I, I had a few illnesses. Um, and in retrospect, there's a gut feeling of mine that my baby orchestrated it. Um, but anyway, the illnesses actually kept me away from my workplace. And in that staying away from my usual place of work and knowledge, I had the opportunity to draw upon the wisdom of several experts in childbirth. Um, and this uh, wisdom was um, 
um, empowering. Um, I um, partook in pregnancy yoga, which um, heightened my sense of awareness of my body. It gave me confidence to birth. Um, it gave me an excitement about giving birth. Um, it helped me communicate with my baby and it actually helped my mo mobility immensely. Um, my pregnancy also resulted in me understanding what some women called inner wisdom. I've seen this in many books subsequent to my birth but hadn't heard of this concept actually whilst, whilst I was pregnant or before. Um, but came to my own conclusion that there's something about the nature of pregnancy, uh, the hormones, um, the life event, um, that can actually bring you closer to a sense of inner knowledge about what is best for the baby and the mother. And I would say uh, it was that, um, that um, central issue that led me to actually having a home birth rather than going for a hospital birth, which uh, was surprising to even myself. Um, it was actually my baby that orchestrated the event. I felt um, in the latter part of pregnancy um, that uh, that was going to be the way I could have the best outcome. Uh, on a very deep personal level, I could feel that if I was in an environment which is fearful and worrying, and certainly my place of work and dealing with all the problems that pregnancy can um, result in um, is an environment that conjures up those images. So in a sense, I felt that if I was away in a very comfortable surrounding such as my home, um, that my body would be able to unfold itself um, and return to that sort of inner knowledge that uh, most women, not all, but most women, the majority of women, can give birth healthily by themselves as part of their health rather than as a part of disease. And I felt that my baby um, almost said to me, I will do it if you just give me the right environment. And I have to say, it was transformational. <laughs> Anybody want to ask her a question? I'm curious about, did it transform your work as a professional, this carrying this heart space? I suppose it, the transformation is so deep that it needs to be speechless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bravo! I love that video. Does anyone have any beautiful thoughts they want to share on that? What's her name again? If you don't mind me asking so I can see the video again. Yes. Uh, her name is Amali. Here, I'll type it here as well so you can look it up. Thank you. Dr. And I'll put the link. Amali Lokugamaje. And I mean, you. I, th I hope you could see and hear at the quality of sound just how touched she was by her own experience of connection with her baby in pregnancy. And Samsara knows I'm a sucker for stories where people within the medical model get converted. <laughs> um, and it's not to say that there isn't a place for the medical model and for medicine, but this was a person who by her own admission was steeped in knowledge to the point that she thought she knew everything. And she also acknowledges that her place of work in obstetrics was a place of much knowledge, but a lot of fear and stress about birth and belief about birth that was explicitly negative. And I love how she says her baby orchestrated her being ill okay. so that she could be away from her place of work, um, which happened to be obstetrics. Um, I think even for a non-obstetrician, sometimes our babies try to orchestrate us being away from the analytical spaces of work. And it doesn't necessarily, maybe you work at the bank and nobody's talking about birth at all. And there's not necessarily fear, but the analytical brain, the left side of the brain is a very different place than where that mind-body connection and the communication and the social learning and the creative aspects of the brain 
and oxytocin activities live. And that's the right side of the brain. So even for a non-obstetrician, this idea that the baby could orchestrate you being away from the workspace is incredible. And I love that she leaned into listening to her body and to her baby and the communication she was experiencing. And she let those intuitions guide her towards other forms of wisdom, including the possibility of home birth, which she had and which you can see she enjoyed very much. Um, so that, that one always chokes me up. It's Anyone else want to? Very big deal. To me, it's like, uh, in my opinion, it's like someone reclaiming their soul. You could just see how she has a part of herself back that perhaps through her upbringing, I'm assuming she's Indian, is she? Do we know? I'm not 100% sure. So um, I'm making an assumption here since I don't know, but I'm just saying, my, 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 I'm wondering if she is a woman of color coming up through a colonized background, that for her, that was a massive reclaiming of her ancestors and listening to her baby, she's listening to her people and it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I'm also really touched at the humility of being in this powerful position of knowing everything and our body bringing us into that state of awe. And that's something that birth can do for any body um, if we let it, right? If we let those unknowns and those big feelings wash over us. And I think sometimes that's the role of the doula. And I 100% agree with Samsara when we say the, the, goal, the, the goal is not to make the feeling of birth go away. <laughs> it's to help that person be with the feeling, be with those big feelings and to let those feelings transform them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's a kickoff point for our discussion really of oxytocin in labor and birth. I'm gonna use some other folks' slides. Some of this is gonna be a little bit more technical. Again, I don't want you to worry too much about every note on here, um, but really like looking at some of these bigger concepts um, and takeaways. Can everyone see okay? I seem to have lost my image of you guys. So I'm sorry, will you pop on if for some reason you can't see? <laughs> I can let me know. see you. I, I can see you and I can see the slide very well. Excellent. Great. Because I can't see you. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go with the Ferguson reflex first, just because I think that's probably familiar to a lot of folks here. This is the idea that during labor, there is what we call a reflex, and it is a cycle in which baby is starting to burrow down with their little head, they're moving lower down into the lower seg segment of the uterus towards the cervix. Maybe their head is pressing up against the cervix. And as they push up against the cervix, that causes some stimulation. It helps the cervix start to stretch out. And that stretching and stimulation stimulates more nerves. And those nerves send signals to the brain to release more oxytocin. And when that oxytocin is released, that oxytocin comes to those receptor sites that I mentioned on the uterus and the smooth muscle lining of the uterus responds to the oxytocin along with some calcium and some other chemical activity by contracting or squeezing those muscle fibers. As that squeeze happens in the uterus, the baby is stimulated to move further down or even pushed further down by that contraction. And their head presses against or their presenting part presses against the cervix some more. And that cervix is stimulated and it stretches open some more and that sends another nerve impulse to the brain and more oxytocin is released. So that cycle is what we call the Ferguson reflex. Now, anyone who has learned this might think, great, I just need a bunch of oxytocin. <laughs> and that's what we see in the hospital. We see people flooded with the synthetic form of oxytocin called pitocin, but it's not that straightforward. This is a slide from a wonderful midwife faculty member in Italy. She's also a spinning babies educator. I got this from her 2020 presentation at the Spinning Babies Conference. Um, there are other chemicals going on in birth, other neuroendocrine transmitters, chemical messengers. And in birth, and hopefully, you know, I don't, again, I don't wish this on anyone, but I, I believe everyone here has probably witnessed in the hospital setting 
or has heard about in the hospital setting or experienced themselves that high level of the Pitocin, the synthetic oxytocin, and thought something is off here in this, in this situation. They're getting lots of oxytocin from the Pitocin, but either the mom is stressed or the baby is stressed. So, so I'm hoping you've noticed that that maybe isn't normal physiology. Um, I wanna break down a little bit that there's good stress and there's bad or pathological stress and that we will refer to as distress. So there's two different aspects of how the central nervous system works. And oxytocin is part of what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And these are British spellings. So you'll notice some things are spelled a little funny, but oxytocin, endorphins, those feel good hormones, um, prolactin, which is related to milk, estrogens, and the right brain, those are all a part of the parasympathetic nervous system. In the earlier slide, I was talking about rest, digest, heal. That state of rest, digest, heal, even create, that is the right side of the brain and the parasympathetic nervous system, including oxytocin. When we feel a fight or flight response, that's the sympathetic nervous system. And that includes adrenaline, also known as the fear hormone, excuse me, uh, cortisol, also known as the stress hormone, vasopressin, and the left brain. Now the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are not good and bad. So although I say good stress and bad stress, what I'm saying is stress itself is not good or bad. There is stress that is useful and there is stress that is pathological or distress. In birth, we need both parts of the central nervous system to be working to some extent. Um, cortisol is a good example. Vasopressin is a good example. Those are used during athletic activity. So when we release some cortisol, maybe we're running, maybe we're laboring, maybe we're having hot sex. That is part of our blood vessels dilating, our blood pumping, our breathing rate increasing because our body is working hard. And we want our body to do those things when we need to. We fall into the category of distress when our blood is pumping too hard or we're not getting enough breaks or our heart is pumping so fast that it's causing some physiological discomfort, okay? So parasympathetic and sympathetic central nervous system activity, both of those are a part of birth. And my little trick, it took me a couple of years to always remember which was sympathetic and which was parasympathetic. And the way I remember is this, your sympathetic nervous system is experiencing sympathy. It is feeling the fear and feeling the stress of the world or the environment or what's going on. The parasympathetic is when you get to rest and digest and heal and recover so that you can then have your sympathetic response when you need it. Um, so that works for me, maybe it will work for some of you. So Midwife Rosetti points out that you actually need some of both of these and you really want to mostly be in the parasympathetic state, but you do need some of these other hormones and activity during birth. And this is why. This is an incredibly fascinating image of a uterus. Um, it is the uterine smooth muscle. And we're most familiar with these long, the, the ones that are filled in in black, these long muscle fibers that go up and down, up and down. What I learned from midwife Rossetti that blew my mind was that not only are these up and down smooth muscle fibers here, but underneath that there's other layers of muscle in the uterus. So there's also these ones that are going diagonally across and at the band, at the lower uterine segment and at the cervix, there's ones that are going circularly around. Um, so, these long ones going up and down, these are mostly the parasympathetic or the oxytocin uh, activity of the muscle. And those are the ones that kind of, we, we in childbirth ed, we use that idea of like scrunching a turtleneck before you put your head through. They're the ones that pull the fibers and the tissues up towards the fundus, towards the top of the uterus. And they create uh, basically a change in the shape of the uterus that encourages the baby down and out.
that is mostly oxytocin and that's what oxytocin stimulates is these muscles of the uterus. This middle layer here, and you can see these little red dots that says blood vessels intertwined by myometrial muscle fibers. These diagonal lines represent these, these, these muscle layers that regulate blood flow. So the blood flow between the mama and the baby through the placenta is regulated by these middle fibers of the uterus. And whether they're really tight or more relaxed is what allows more or less blood to flow between the parent and the baby. So that middle layer, that middle layer is made mainly uh, has nerves that are related to the sympathetic nerve system, which is the cortisol. And it needs to have some reactivity and some responsivity and be active in a way that allows the, the, synch the, the symphony of all of these chemicals and all of these muscular activities allows the correct blood flow from parent to child during the labor process. And then this inner layer, these round fibers are also that sympathetic nervous system. So even though these big main long fibers, these longitudinal external ones are oxytocin induced and, and the nerves in those ones are related to oxytocin, we do need these other ones to be active too. So that's why we need some balance. And I think that's just an incredible image. I encourage you to learn more about the uterus, especially if you wanna be a birth worker, because again, it's not this machine where it just has this one action and one is done. It's this very dynamic muscle that does incredible things. And when we treat it like a machine and we just pump up the volume of the oxytocin all the way to 20, 22, um, there can be some consequences of that. So what does the action of these different parts of the nervous system look like on the uterus? So as I mentioned, these long fibers that go up and down, the top of the uterus is the fundus, the bottom is the cervix. Those, those oxytocin nerve related fibers, they do this upwards motion and is actually contracting the uterus in the way we think about a contraction that is actually gonna thicken the top of the uterus over time and help the baby be pushed down and out. The sympathetic nervous system is this more spiraling internal layer, and it's part of what is helping to ch change the cervical tissue. So that was, those are some of the ways the parasympathetic and the sympathetic act on the uterus. And again, these are uh, midwife Rossetti's slides. Um, again, this is, a, this is a more complex slide. I'm not gonna go into it fully, but I wanna again, distinguish between good normal physiology and stress in labor versus distress or pathological stress. So just thinking about physiology, when we have a labor that is going along with physiology, it's rhythmic, um, it is compensated with rest. So between contractions, there are pauses. It is naturally creating oxytocin, which is creating that sense of connection and well-being with baby, which promotes bonding. Uh, the pause between contraction is also releasing endorphins. It promotes the baby being born. And over time, and this is midwife Rossetti's take, um, but I love it, because it's releasing all these endorphins, because it's releasing so much oxytocin, it is neuromodulating the mother or changing her brain to be focused towards caring for the baby. Now, when we have physiological normal stress and physiological labor, all of these things are possible. When we have distress and the levels of cortisol and adrenaline become very high, we have what is distress or pathological stress. And that's when we see static labor or contractions that are static, that are not rhythmical or that are very, very long and drawn out or scattered. They're not compensated with a pause or the pain doesn't cease. They cause emotional and psychological distress. The hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline are overactivated, that stress response of the sympathetic nervous system. It can block the process of birth and we'll see why in just a minute. And instead of neuromodulating the mother towards care, it causes stress and fear and it modulates her towards survival. And a fight or flight or freeze response is very different 
than a tend and befriend response. So why does it block labor? Well, if the sympathetic nervous system or the high levels of cortisol is in overdrive, or if you're pumping so much Pitocin into the person's body that they're getting so many uh, of those outer layer uterine contractions that there's no break and the muscle itself is starting to exhaust itself, there can be too much uh, buildup of, of cortisol. There can be too much buildup of pain. There can be more stress. There can be more fear. And the service responds to distress with congestion, swelling, and closure. It can make it so that the cervix is unresponsive and that the uterus is unresponsive to the continued dosage of Pitocin. It can inhibit the Ferguson's reflex because everything gets congested and swollen and painful and we see a stalled labor. Now I'm just gonna pause for a second. Where is the wisdom in this? Where is the wisdom in the cervix swelling up and closing and labor stalling if the parent is feeling a lot of distress? Conditions are unsafe for the baby. Conditions are unsafe. So whether it's a disrespectful attitude towards the birthing person, whether it's obstetric violence where they're, they're being handled unsafely, whether it's that they're starving and they're thirsty and people are refusing to give them food and water, the parent, the birthing parent's body says, this is not safe. We are distressed. Right. The dyad of the mother and the baby or the parent and the baby is distressed. It is not safe to come out. And so this is painful and uncomfortable, but I think there's wisdom to this that the body is saying, nope, not gonna have this baby here. This is not a safe place for us. So that might be over romanticized a little bit, but I really think there's wisdom there in that in, in all we learn in science, we sometimes forget that the mammalian and the reptilian brain are really good at protecting the lineage and protecting life. And if, if the environment is signaling your life is not respected, your life is not valued, we are not listening to you, you are not being protected, we are not trustworthy, why would I open up for, you, for that, right? So there's wisdom in this. Um, sometimes what we see happen, and this is so this is so hard for the parent, especially when we've been working as a doula to trust their body, trust the process. If there is even a, whether it's a subconscious emotional thing because of the way they're being treated, if it's because they're being fed fearful language in the hospital, if it's because they're being treated badly, if it's because they're being pumped early and often with chemicals that are not supporting labor, um, it can be really difficult. And I do wanna just say disclaimer, it's, there, there's not a black and white of like, if you use Pitocin, this will happen, right? It's what, when the Pitocin is used, how much is used, and most of all, what is happening around that use of Pitocin? Does the person feel that they've consented? Do they feel safe? Do they feel on board? Is the person, uh, is the person administering the Pitocin doing a really gentle and gradual administration of Pitocin? Um, are they getting touch and loving care and massage and changing positions around it? How we use Pitocin does matter, and the, the science shows that when, the, when a small amount of Pitocin or the right amount of Pitocin for somebody who is already in their natural labor pattern, and for some reason, which I actually can't think about the moment, um, they get a little bit of an extra boost, that Pitocin can restart the Ferguson reflex, but that's like minimum effective dosage. And we do not practice minimum effective dosage uh, in our hospitals. Um, and Nelly says, I saw it at the last birth of stalled labor. Yeah, so we see this all the time where they have painful static contractions. And you've seen it, right? Like it seems like the, the contractions going on for like two and a half minutes. And it's really just like a bunch of contractions it sucks. The decrease of blood flow, blood flow between the fetus and the placenta. So that middle layer that's moderating blood flow 
if it's all tight and intense and congested, that's cutting off baby's blood supply and we see babies in distress. We see obstructed labor from the swelling of the cervix. Um, we see reduced heart rate variability. We wanna see variability, so that's not a good thing. Extra pain, more distress, and all the normal benefits of that normal pause, that space between contractions where mama and baby can oxygenate, where those endorphins are released, where that next round of feel good hormones comes in, all of that can be lost. And so it's really not a great thing. Um, I'm just gonna pause. Is that making sense that like there are times when if Pitocin is applied carefully, it could stimulate the Ferguson reflex and the person's body can take over and the Pitocin can get shut off. But when we flood someone's system with oxytocin, especially when we do it early, early in labor and frequently at a high volume, it can cause this kind of impact, right? So I just wanna highlight there's nuance here. It's, it's not really, you try to think of it as an ecosystem or as a symphony and there's all these different parts playing their part, but that's why we can't just walk in. Oh, it's my shift. Oh, this person's going slow. I'm going to crank that Pitocin up. That's not going to work for everybody. And we see that for most bodies, it doesn't work. Um, if well, we are, it's also good practice for doulas. If you have a client who needs, sometimes people need medicine, mm -hmm. not as many people who are getting medicine, but sometimes people need it. And to help the client get into that safe place that, that uh, Jessalyn is talking about, touching the client, massaging the client, because the client, if she's not, if, they, if they're not on an epidural, they can still feel. So stimulating the person's still organic oxytocin production. And I physically, I say to my clients, we're gonna let the Pitocin do its job. We're gonna embrace the medication that you need. So that they're in that accepting place they're not fighting it or feeling bad or being distressed because they have the medication. If you work with that medication, that's a part of the nuance that Jessalyn is talking about. Mm -hmm. And then it can be effective and it can be less of the determinant of the birth outcome. It can be the medication and not driving the whole show. And less um, traumatic for sure. Yes. And we see this with epidurals too. There is some evidence that in some bodies, Pitocin and epidural combined can stall labor, which is really just the recipe we give people. Um, again, it depends on when in the labor, that context and that care that Samsara just described. Um, but we also know that sometimes, like I, I had a client who was very distressed, mid peak COVID, May, 2020, very, very distressed, mentally stressed running a lot of cortisol, running a lot of fear. There was some bleeding, which increased fear. Her cervix was inflamed, blew up like a balloon. It was not safe for her to actually, she was feeling the urge to bear down, but it was just because of her cervix being so swollen. And the, the epidural really helped her to feel calm and to have less pain and less fear and to stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. In that situation, that medicine was helping to be harm reduction. But had they cranked the Pitocin just because maybe she was seven centimeters and we could get there and they had done the epidural and the Pitocin at the same time, that could have been a big mess and that could have actually really hurt her. So there's, there's nuance to these medications. And um, I think without having to be an expert in all of this, when we work with our clients over the longer term, we can help them understand that it's not just a black and white use of anything. There's the appropriate use of medication and there's inappropriate use of medication and that timing and support and informed consent all matter because it creates that safe space. Um, so maybe we've seen this and people have seen, we, we had a comment in the chat about stalled labor. Sometimes if we also see hyperstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system or the cortisol response, that lower section of the uterus gets really, um, tense and we see maybe it even kind of hurts to touch the belly or maybe there's pain in between the contractions so there isn't really a pause it's just like muscular pain and this can actually be a buildup of lactic acid because of the hyperstimulation um, and it can be just difficult to move around 
Um, so that lactic acidosis is basically when we work out really, really hard and our muscles get sore because they're breaking things down and metabolizing differently. This can happen during labor if there's a hyper stimulated sympathetic response. So that soreness, that touch, the, the uterine pain, even be actions um, and not, not really understanding like, why am I still hurting? I'm not contracting, why am I still hurting? Mm -hmm. um, so what happened, uh, what happens in the case study that midwifery, midwife Rosetta, Rosetti describes for this is exactly what Samsara was just saying. If somebody's having this hyper-stimulated response, uh oh. Sarah's face as a uh oh. So, Jessalyn, you froze a bit. You froze a bit while you were speaking. Could you repeat what you were saying? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. So the, the example uh, midwife Rosetti gave was if you have this situation of lactic acidosis where there's pain at the on the belly, at any touch around the uterus, pain between contractions, irregular contractions, um, no relief. What they can do when they've shown this in a clinical setting is they can reverse this hyperstimulated process by turning off the Pitocin, basically clearing the room, turning the lights down, doing breathing as the, the nervous system starts to calm down and the person starts to feel that sense of privacy and safety, very, very gently starting to do some touch because it can be painful. So when you think about when you're working out and your muscles get sore, it's like, oh, like it hurts. So it's describing to the client, okay, your muscles were working really hard and they've kind of gone into what we call lactic acidosis. They've gotten really sore. So I'm going to, I'm going to do some massage when you're ready to help knead out some of that soreness. And the clinician can actually do this if they're trained. Um, but usually it's going to, in our setting, it's probably going to be a doula doing some, um, with permission or helping the client to massage their own abdomen. And it might be uncomfortable at first, maybe using a hot shower, hot water, mm -hmm. helping them to literally like move the lactic acid out of their muscles. That's what we're doing. We're, it's like if you got a sports massage after doing a marathon, it's mm -hmm. gonna move that lactic acid out of the muscles. So we, we turn off the Pitocin, we turn off the lights, we get into a safe space emotionally, we help them understand what's going on and that it's temporary. And then we can actually physically help them reset. And this was again, a presentation by a midwife. So, um, I think it's worth like talking about this with the client um, so they understand what's going on and maybe encouraging them to ask their clinician like, hey, it seems like I'm experiencing some lactic acid buildup. <laughs> Can we take a big pause with the Pitocin and do some body work and some movement and some hot water to help me reset? Um, those are all available. And as long as baby's doing okay, uh, it should be something that is available to you. So coming back to this, um, I want to return to this idea of that pause and what I mentioned earlier about neuromodulation. So neuromodulating the parent towards care is in that pause um, in terms of what is happening in the brain. And let's be honest, for most first-time parents, for most, most first-time birthing people, before they do it, they're like, I have no idea how an eight-pound, eight-and-a-half-pound baby is going to exit my body from this tiny orifice mm -hmm. of my body. Like, I know it's happened. Conceptually, you keep telling me women have been doing this for thousands of years. I get it, but I do not believe you. <laughs> There's a lot of people who feel that way. Part of what oxytocin and the pause in labor does is it's moving the birthing person away from that analytical brain that says this is impossible. And it's moving them towards their creative brain. So we've talked a little bit about this, the left side of the brain, the analytical side of the brain, that's gonna be triggered by any kinds of distractions. Um, but we wanna be able to give them positive distractions or help them cope with these negative ones. So stressors, negative language, um, interruptions by the staff, 
limitations of protocol or language or even just cultural expectations. Um, the attempts to control every detail and track every number, that's all very analytical, left side of the brain. Muscular tension, psychological stress, this is what is gonna happen if we're trying to control every part of the process. Time limits are a big one. So we need to help people cope with these or distract them from these kinds of things to help them move away from their analytical brain and then get them into their creative right brain where we feel possibility, where we feel that, that intuitive communication with baby, where we have sense over language. And so getting to know your client for more than two visits, highly recommended because we don't wanna always be relying on talk, talk, talk. I'm a big talker, but usually by the time I meet with my client at labor, we've known each other for months. And I might be saying very simple words that are more like a mantra than a long communication. And we've done our childbirth ed. So we don't have to learn all the informed consent on site in that moment. There's less talking because I don't want them learning about <laughs> lactic acid and induction devices and endorphin and uh, sorry, uh, epidural timing. I want us to have already discussed all of that so they can be in their sensing mind instead of their language. Creating safety, creating a safe space, creating freedom of movement, freedom to eat, freedom to be naked, freedom to change the temperature, freedom to make sounds, um, allowing for intuitive movements, um, encouraging that endorphin response and like letting that expression of that pleasure even be a part of the setting. Um, and leaning into their bonding instincts. That's what we see with the creative brain. And this shift from the left into the right brain through the course of birth is what gets the parent ready to be a parent because the end goal is not just to get the baby out and send them on their way. It's to get the baby out and for that baby and the parent and their community to meet and to rejoice and to live and thrive outside of the womb. These are some beautiful images. <laughs> Graphics are beautiful. <laughs> it was his little knapsack. <laughs> no, we're not going to send the baby off into the wilderness. We want no, that so out. Cute, And that parent feel equipped to nourish. And you know who feels really equipped to nurture a baby? The person who just did the thing that they thought was not possible and got that baby out of that small orifice of their body for the first time. <laughs> Let me just jump in real quick and say that when the mama does that, when the birthing person does that, there's a flood of all kinds of other chemicals that drench that person's brain. And neurologists tell us that there's a whole center of that person's brain that is opened up that was not open before. That's something I'm very excited about. I love watching that happen to my clients. And I like seeing how the, the trajectory of their motherhood, the parenthood goes when that happens for them. In the old school, people say, oh, when you're a mother, you have the third eye, right? You have that third sense, that sixth sense. And um, of course, this is completely unscientific. However, I believe that that's the moment when that happens for that person, that there's a click between that birthing person and that baby that's different for every baby. There's a different wash, there's a different set of, of, of instructions, so let us say, from the creator for that mama and that baby. Uh, and be different every child you have. And um, I, I, I grieve that more and more of my clients are not getting to have that feeling. Now, if you have to have a highly medicated birth, are there other ways to get that to happen? Yes, there are. But then again, very few people really need a highly medicated birth. Well, and give yourself some credit, some sour, because it's actually not unscientific at all. We know- Sensible is not scientific. <laughs> we know that the brain wave frequency of natural labor actually does bring, um, so when we're functioning right now, we're in what's called like beta wavelength, where we're like chatting, we're in our analytical brain wave. Um, when people are in their labor pattern, safe, uninterrupted, protected, in the zone, so to speak, the same way an athlete can get in the zone, mm -hmm. they actually can enter into a slower brainwave frequency. 
um, and it's comparative, com comparable, um, especially uh, the most like current example that we have is like monks in deep meditation. Um, but there's two, one is theta and one is delta. So theta is a little slower than normal and then delta is even slower. And theta is kind of like that, like twilight meditative subconscious space. It's where our REM sleep occurs. Mm -hmm. It's where we have those intuitive breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is 100% science. It's just some people aren't as into it as others, but that's the brain wavelength we are in when we are having that experience. And then delta is that like deepest relaxation of restoration. So kind of more so that theta is where that kind of intuitive, almost like cosmic connection can happen. And that is, that has been measured as happening among the, the brave birthing people who've let their brain scans be measured while they're doing that. It's where the Sufis go when they're spinning. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm gonna play a really short, it's like three and a half minutes. This is Michel Odent. He is a French evolutionary anthropologist. He writes a lot about oxytocin and birth. He was a obstetrician and a midwife and an anthropologist, I believe. And he became a midwife because he was fascinated with uh, the power of the midwifery model. It's particularly in this idea of protecting this hormonal lineage. So as Samsara said, we have so many um, births that could be uninterrupted or unmedicated and don't go that way. And we're seeing more and more and more of that. And people are maybe missing out on this experience sometimes. Um, that's for each individual to deal with in their own lives. But when we look at our population level, it's actually a systemic issue. And we also see that systemically it impacts some populations more than others. Um, so he talks about the love cocktails and birth in this video and the context of why I'm sharing his voice in particular. And I'll put his um, name here as well, is he's concerned that we might be losing some of our cognitive imprinting and the aspect of these hormones that make us the social mammals that we are today. So I'm gonna share this. Until recently, in spite of many cultural interferences, to have a baby, until recently, a woman was obliged to rely on the release of a sort of hormonal cocktail. Mammals in general, including human mammals, release hormones to have babies. The main ones being oxytocin, but others, prolactin, uh, endorphins, uh, vasopressin, and so on. So we can say today, in a current scientific context, that it, this is, in fact, a cocktail of love hormones. Today we know a lot about the behavioral effect of this hormone. It's just, not just contracting the uterus and having baby born, it's also having an effect on the behavior of the mother. So that's why we can say, until now, to have a baby, women were obliged to rely on the release of a cocktail of love hormones. But today, it's different. Today, at the level of the planet, the number of women who give birth to the baby and to the placenta, only thanks to the release of their natural hormones, this number is approaching zero. I said the baby and the placenta, because the highest peak of oxytocin, that you say, low, the main love hormone, a woman can release during her whole life, is not for the birth itself, it's for the birth of the placenta, after the birth of the baby. So this number now is approaching zero, for reasons easy to explain. Most women now, to give birth to the baby and to the placenta, need a drip of synthetic oxytocin. Oxytocin is the main hormone in childbirth. Most women today cannot release their natural oxytocin. They need 
substitute, a pharmacological substitute for the natural hormone. There is a trip of synthetic oxytocin that block the release of natural hormone without having the same behavioral effect. Also, they usually need drugs, pain relief, pain relief, different ways, particularly epidural anesthesia, replacing en endorphins. And many women today, as everybody knows, give birth by caesarean section. So finally, when you mix all that, we can say that today, and at a turning point in the history of childbirth, the number of women who give birth to the baby and to the placenta is approaching zero. Um, That's so terrifying to me. Yes, and, and there's a little bit of like the language difference. So when he said they need, what I think he's saying is he's referring to the statistics that people are given induction drugs or Pitocin is used in labor instead of either cultivating or waiting for or finding ways to support a natural hormonal cycle. That being said, we also live in a very unique, unprecedented time for birthing people who identify as women in that most of us are very much in the analytical brain a lot of the day. So before the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, women were always working people, but they were also always care providing people in their families. And today we have a lot more division where someone might, um, and I don't say this with like any like personal gender bias. It's just like the reality is that myself as a cis woman, I am more likely today than in the past to maybe be spending like a 13 hour workday at a law office or a 10 hour workday doing accounting and maybe not be around any children or kin or care providing, or I might be doing both those things, but aspirationally, and this has to do with white supremacy ideology as well, aspirationally, we define so much of success and um, making it by measure of a white corporate male bodied model of analytical success that there's always this drive towards more and more left-brained activity. Exactly. Um, that, that is just something that is happening in our culture at this time. I understand that everyone's individual relationship to that, of course, is going to vary. But I think what uh, Dr. Odette is trying to say is that people are like going from the boardroom to the birth room and they're not coming back into their bodies. They're not necessarily having the experience or listening to the experience that Dr. Amali shared of, hold on, my baby's trying to tell me something and get me to stop going work to work for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or get me to stop we're reading all this fear and stress-based material or get me into my right brain. And that isn't happening. And I have worked with wonderful, intelligent, savvy, incredible women who have worked up through into their labor, even though I begged them to get off of their emails, right? right so that right. person who's answering public health related work emails into their labor is very much in their left brain and not going to be releasing oxytocin. So I think that's what Dr. Odent is talking about. And the concern is that if that continues, we may actually lose our ability to produce that. And so as doulas, we also are protecting a lineage. Someone wrote legacy earlier up in the chat. I'm not sure what they were referring to, but we are protecting the oxytocin lineage when we encourage people to get informed about spontaneous physiology of birth. So that is a gift that we get to um, be guardians of that lineage. And it's a challenge as well. So coming back, um, we have the, these positive feed loops, uh, feedback loops. The, as I said, the, the goal is not just to get baby out the goal is to then have baby in the home with parent being nurtured, being cared for, continuing to build that connection that started in the womb, that communication, and starting to imprint these same capacities into the little baby for that facial recognition, that social bonding, this eye contact here, 
this this expression of love is laying this blueprint both through the digestive system through the sense of safety and calm and connection through the actual nourishment and then through the psychological process that is coming here this is laying the social imprint of empathy social connection well-being trust and calm and i know that not everybody can lactate and not everybody has the option to or maybe that option was removed because of the way early uh, postpartum or birth was handled. Nonetheless, more time spent skin to skin is going to be a great habitat for cultivating that oxytocin imprint. This is um, from Hope Parrish, who's an educator with Kappa. This is 2016. Um, so at skin to skin, and whether the baby is actually latched on or whether they're using a lactation aid, or even if they're doing skin to skin with bottle feeding, they get to see mom's eyes, they get to smell her body and or her milk, they get to taste the mom's skin and or milk, they get to touch, they get that skin to skin chest contact, they're warmed, and remember warmth is a part of oxytocin, um, if whether it's human milk or if it is the lactation aid or bottle milk, that milk should be warm and that's gonna also be warm in their belly. Um, the skin to skin contact is extended to the back where the parent's arm is holding them. They're moving with the parent. And I'm sorry, I'm just saying mom here because that's what's on this slide, but it could be any feeding parent. And they're also hearing the parent's voice. So this is really what's gonna give that oxytocin and that social imprint. Um, and that can be done, it can it be done most easily with latching and with, with transfer of human milk, but can also be done in other feeding arrangements. Um, the pathway that stimulates those parts of the brain for both the baby and the mom, again, this is kind of a thick slide, so don't worry about writing it all down, but basically when that's happening with that skin to skin contact and with feeding, uh, that oxytocin is released and it travels to 14 different areas of the parent and the baby's brain and is released into circulation. So 14 different areas of the brain are lighting up and that's huge for neural development and for newborn development. Um, the first place that that uh, oxytocin pathway stops is the brainstem. And that's where that, that sympathetic response, the stress and fight, fight or flight and the parasympathetic response you live. And so by stopping at the brainstem, it gets to switch from the stress response to the calm and content response or from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. Um, we like to start out in the parasympathetic. So feeding on demand means feeding as soon as you see signs of hunger. Um, but if a baby is crying or getting activated because they couldn't get to the food quite quickly enough, um, getting into a good skin to skin situation, especially right before feeding can really help calm both parent and baby down. Um, oxytocin is gonna switch that, that state of stress into one of calm. And then once that is activated, there, there's kind of a cascade. It goes down through the, the spinal cord. Um, and there's a really interesting system called uh, polyvagal theory about this that is gonna go affect our heart rate. It's gonna go affect um, our overall stress levels, our heart rhythm, our breathing. And we know that skin to skin is benefits for, for all of these aspects for the baby, for their heart rate, for their breathing, for their temperature control, for their stress response. So again, whether or not lactation is occurring, skin to skin after the birth is incredibly important for continuing the oxytocin exchange and, and that human lineage of the oxytocin social response and, and development. Um, this is the biochemistry of trust. This is part of what Dr. Amali was describing with her child. And this can continue into our adult relationships, whether we're parenting people or not. It goes in both directions, right? So maybe we were raised and we carried that forward into our relationships. And, and maybe we didn't experience that, but we are able to find a partnership or even a friendship um, where we have uh, the option of trusted, safe contact. Um, but particularly the biochemistry of trust is 
modulated through a kinship model. Um, and that doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a man and a woman, it doesn't have to be a parent and child, it could be an auntie and child, it could be a grandparent, it could be co-parents living together or apart, it could be multiple families living together, but having that trusted eye contact, that trusted touch, that trusted nurturing and care, this is the imprint of uh, trust and, and it imprints in the brain and it's something that we get to uh, cultivate in our own relationships and pass on the next one. So those of us caring for pregnant people, we really want to um, help them avoid isolation. We want to um, help them know that we are a safe, connected space during our time together um, to help protect that oxytocin lineage. Um, maybe it's a hot meal, maybe it's a walk outside in nature. Um, and if Felicia had mentioned her window full of nature, being out in nature or exposed to the elements is also a way that we get to connect with oxytocin, which I think is a beautiful little hack because we are mammals after all. Um, and so in that sense, I really don't even think of it as being exposed to nature. I think of it as being exposed to our home environment as opposed to a synthesized environment. And I love my home. I'm really grateful to have a home. Um, but the, the mammalian environment is in nature. And so if you think about that as actually the familiar space, it makes sense that that would create that sense of belonging. I do wanna note that we all have different settings and environments and contexts. So being in nature could be those windows that Felicia mentioned. It could be walking the dog. It could be watering plants in your city apartment. It might uh, just be going to the boardwalk and watching the seagulls in the ocean. It doesn't have to be this person who's out in the desert under the full sliver of moon, um, but whatever you can do to get some nature time is also helpful. Um, this is me and my dog. Just a reminder that all mammals are gonna exchange oxytocin. So if you can cuddle your mammal friend, your furry friend, that warmth, that touch, connection, eye contact, those are also things that you can get with a pet. That's also a thing our clients can get. So if we have a single parent by choice, but they have a kitty, encourage them to cuddle a kitty after our prenatal session. Um, if we're living far away from loved ones, I mentioned earlier, you can get on Zoom and you can make a hot meal and eat it while you talk to your grandparents or your friends or your loved ones who are in different places. Um, already talked about nature a little bit, just some more beautiful art from Alex Gray. Um, encouraging our relationships between siblings, between youth. Um, we talked about it at the beginning, not everybody starts out with a safe parental environment, um, but we've seen, we have seen over and over in our work and in our lives that intergenerational trauma can stop in one generation if an older brother or sister, or elder sibling chooses to uh, be that safe and trusted person for the younger sibling, um, chooses to be their guardian and to love and nurture them, regardless of what the adults in their life are doing. Um, and of course, in our, in our romantic relationships, taking time for touch, taking time for eye contact. And I also just wanna empower all of us, regardless of what relationships we do or do not have in our life, that self-love, self-care, um, self-touch and pleasure, whether it's sexual or not, it could be putting lotion on, eating a hot meal, it could be masturbation, it could be adorning yourself, even if you aren't currently in a social context with another safe, trusted person, you can evoke and create oxytocin in your own relationship with yourself, which is something that I think is incredibly empowering and needed really. Um, because who but ourselves do we deserve that love from at the end of the day, most of all, I think really leaning into ways to honor yourself and again, that could just be taking your time after a bath to put on some oil. It could be smelling your own hair and your fresh laundry and just taking your time to dress in a way that makes you feel really good and gazing into yourself lovingly in the mirror. Or it could be more intimate pleasures 
those are available to you um, and worthy of your time and attention if um, other kinds of, of trusted touch and care and eye contact aren't currently available to you. Um, so the more I learn, and I hope you join me in this, I feel inspired. I also feel concerned, but I feel focused towards some of these, these concepts, one being that pre prenatal health is important. Um, it's particularly around individual relationships to self, but also partners and the community as a whole. And this can happen with nutrition, connection. And when I say conscious choice, I mean informed choice, education, learning about these aspects of our physiology and how the system does or does not serve that that greater lineage of oxytocin. So pre-prenatal health is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I am also focused on the state of support and connection received from people gestating babies, specifically from co-parenting partners, but also from family and social networks and societal institutions. And so most of my work in the past year has been online. I do a lot of coaching with modern families and parents around asking for what they need and setting boundaries and expressing love and forgiveness for their own mental health and well-being, regardless of uh, whether their family is able to follow suit on um, cultivating that self-love or at least that um, family unit of love, even if the extended family isn't on board. And um, I don't say that in the wishy-washy woo-woo way. I say that very much in this way we've been talking about for the last hour and a half of um, taking time away from devices, taking time to be present, taking time to make eye contact, eat a meal together, um, and deciding what aspects of that kind of behavior is important in the family culture and what we wanna pass on to our children and, and recreate in our family culture. Um, I'm also you know, very much motivated to protect the access to the physiologically spontaneous uninterrupted birth and labor that we've been talking about, as well as nursing. And I really consider this to be an imperative for evolution and sustainability as a species. And of course, the education and empowerment of all people to reclaim our bodily capacities and know that we are valuable and sovereign and functional and worthy of reverence in our body or at the very least respect. And that when we lean into some of these keys, these keys of our physiology and, and how that relates to our relationships, we can feel more connected and peaceful and whole as a global community. So that's it for today. Um, let's make some space for questions or reflections. How are folks feeling about the information you just received? If we can have cameras on, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I think Jesslyn, thank you, as always. <laughs> Every time you present this, there's something new to like learn and relearn and like be regrounded in. Um, like the hopefulness and the concern. <laughs> definitely concerning mm -hmm. <laughs> for the overall, for the planet. And just like, but the reminder of our connectedness um, and that there was, there are ways of repair. You know, like Samsara mentioned earlier, you know, even if things go a different way during a birth, there are ways to help the birthing person have some reconnection and how essential that is. And like as doulas, the way that we can support our clients in facilit facilitating that and for ourselves, like this was very self-reflective. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you again. Thank you for being here, it's my pleasure. Well, it's a, you know, the focus on oxytocin is a really hopeful focus. And I really, you know, I, I love, 
how you present it. And um, it's important for us to rem remember it. And that's what we talk about all day. Certainly as dualists, we ought to be talking about it all the time with our clients because they're not getting it from the way, the way medical providers are trained nowadays. They're not, they might not even know. I don't know what they're being taught in medical school. Luckily, I never went there. But um, that is their... There, it, it all comes from this dysfunctional misunderstanding of Christianity, in my humble opinion. It's got people feeling like, like A, God doesn't love women for some crazy reason. And, and God abandons us when we do the thing that fr be fruitful and multiply means. So it's insulting to me as a Christian that, that, this is that the people who say they're Christians believe anything other than that God loves us. And God wants this experience, though it is challenging, it doesn't have to be as challenging as it is in our culture. Because when we go to other cultures, when we give birth to the big fat babies with a lot less trauma than we see women do in our culture, right? It's, it's safer, more oxytocin flows if you're in a culture where you feel like you're loved and the culture is waiting to embrace you and your baby where in a, a typical hospital birth in the United States, or even people trying to have a home birth have to work through that. Mm -hmm. It's fear that they're gonna die, it's fear that there's something wrong with them, it's not gonna work. You know, people trying to be positive, but they're not really, until the baby's out and they're like, oh, praise God, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But when you get to be confident from the beginning of the process, it's a very different road, it's very different. I think also there's like just a fear of change in general. And I feel oxytocin is very hopeful, hopeful in that it frames the changes of reproduction as powerful and letting birth change us. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big piece of it. Um, like I can't wait to be transformed by my birth. God is willing. Um, and so I, I hope this class is a piece of change for all of us in our own lives too. Like, I just want to own, like, I don't always make eye contact with people when I'm feeling introverted and I'm trying to make new friends in my new town. And I don't always take the time to step away from my device when I should, but it's learning about oxytocin has helped me to work on being more connected with myself and others. And it is a practice. It's not like, tomorrow because I taught the class tonight like I'm going to be best friends with everyone in my neighborhood and everyone's going to be having babies and orgasms on the street like it's a practice and we all have to practice it together if we want to so I hope I hope I'm, and I'm open to more comments but I do hope that this this collection of information that I'm oh I'm still learning and gathering is a piece of positive change in your own life I think I personally have so many thoughts going through my head that it's kind of hard to figure out where I want to start. But first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for this offering because it was extremely insightful. And I unfortunately missed about the first 30 minutes, but I, I feel as though I've walked away with a whole different perspective on oxytocin specifically. Second of all, um, you know, it was really resonating me, with me, what we were talking about, you know, potentially losing that as, as the part of our birth because of the society and the trauma and the limiting beliefs and the obstetric violence and just things that birthing people are going through, you know, in, in this day and age. And um, I just personally finished a hypnobirthing educators cohort today. And so a lot of what we talked about that was a uh, fear release and, you know, switching those affirmations from those based in fear because the universe doesn't recognize I don't or I can't, you know, flipping those around and then trying to make a positive, um, you know, statement out of even places of fear or places of uncertainty within our bodies. And I, I think that just continuing this wisdom and passing those on to, you know, everybody that we come into contact with, because, you know, it, that's kind of essentially our mission here as, as doulas and working with birthing people and, and being, you know, gifted with the immense honor of being in their birthing space with them. I just feel like this whole 
this whole presentation has me wanting to like shout it from the rooftops about how important it is just to like respect physiological birth. And I think it's insane that it's 2022 and we're still talking, still talking about that, <laughs> literally still talking about that. Um, and, you know, kind of just back to what Samsara was saying about Christianity and this whole belief and this convoluted like patriarchal colonialism that we're living in right now. I was also um, by the hypnobirthing educating instructor referred to a documentary. It's from, I believe like 1990 called The Burning Times. And it's talking about how, um, you know, essentially midwifery was shamed and they were forced into hiding because the wise women or the witches that were just recognized as people with all of this skill and all of this knowledge and all of this wisdom were forced into hiding because of, you know, modern Christianity and the patriarchy. And so this feels a lot kind of like that, which is interesting just, you know, to share the wisdom and to share that collective space with, with everybody here. So again, just thank you for all this information. It's, it's been incredible. Thank you for coming. And uh, I think the first 15 minutes we were mostly checking in. So hopefully you only missed a little tiny smidgen. <laughs> Well, thank you also for um, having this discussion. Um, I'm with her with the hypnobirthing because we just get a small snippet of that in our class. Mm -hmm. um, so this just brings it to a more um, human uh, mindset than what the, the scientific mindset of everything. So I appreciate that um, so much. Um, that's all I can say is thank you because it did it, it opened up my mind to a whole different way of looking at it than even how we we are taught in the hypnobirthing classes it's, it's and so thank you and I have much much notebook paper <laughs> I'm glad you got it and you know I love I love affirmations for birth I'm not hypnobirthing trained but um uh, the name of the documentary was The Burning Times, I believe. Um, but uh, going back to affirmations, this, I was already using affirmations in EFT in my life and in birth, but when I learned about oxytocin, that really put a lot of fire into my affirmations. And sometimes, you know, my clients who work with me closely, they get the whole spiel. Sometimes they get pieces of this um, presentation. But sometimes I think, you know, when maybe someone first meets me, it's like, how do you say that affirmation with so much faith and confidence it's like well, because it's not a lie <laughs> like my body does have a wisdom beyond what I'm able to conceptualize and my body and my baby do know in ways that may not be recognized by you know classical clinical settings so the more we learn about just how incredible spirit and body are when combined and that it is like it's, it's not a matter of faith, it's just facts. It's just whether you just choose to tap into it or not. I think that can be really invigorating for any any personal practice around, um, you know, self-care, but also mentality and spirituality as well. Yeah, one of our, um, one of our meditations that we learn is fear. So we learn how to um, redirect the the members are the mama's mind off of the fear we have different um different hypno techniques like there's one that brings you into a uh, a forest so this it's all geared about a positiveness so this is really helpful because mm -hmm. you can really see why it's so important so i do i really thank you yeah. As I'm gonna keep on telling you, I think. <laughs> okay. I I had a workshop once called um, "Fear: An Hour of Getting Into It" because in the birthing space, especially if you have staff members coming in and saying, "Oh, well, you don't want to hurt the baby," and saying these kind of fear-ridden things, sometimes what we see is that the birthing person very righteously does not feel safe, <laughs> and it's that is valid. And I think one of our jobs as a doula is to acknowledge what's causing the fear and to help then that help distract from it or help to move from it and recenter on what's going right. Because a lot of the time, there's two instances, right? There's there's the fake fear. There's the people coming in with their fear about what happened in the last room or what they learned in school. There's that fear. 
And then there's fear when there is something wrong and the mom or the birthing person is feeling it and not being listened to. And in both cases, I want to honor the birthing person's feelings. Because in one situation, it's like this person is full of baloney and let's refocus on how, what an incredible job you and baby are doing and that you're both healthy and safe and okay. And if there's something that's actually wrong, I really want to focus on, I'm listening to you, mama. Point to where you're feeling that pain that feels different than before or help me understand what we need to do next. Um, and maybe that's through movement, maybe that's through words, maybe that's through time with um, the most preferred <laughs> provider in, around. Um, so I just wanna honor that fear has a role. And sometimes it's fear that really does need to be listened to. And other times it's fear that is somebody else's and not for the birthing person to be carrying. And that's also part of the art of the doula is helping to discern that and then to help our, our client focus where their focus needs to go to be safe and to have their healthy, happy, connected outcome. And the big, big piece too is around, you know, having our medical people listen to feeling states that don't feel scientific to them. So the birthing person or the new postpartum mama comes in and says, I don't, something doesn't feel right. Something is not right. And they scan you with the sconogram or whatever and say, well, you're fine. And, she, and she's like, no, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. That means you don't send that person home. That means you keep that person. You don't just shoo that off because it's, oh, that's an old wives tale or a woman's little feeling. Right. <laughs> I'm going to stop for I that. Hate, I hate the phrase old wives tale as if that makes it just discredit, credits it. No, I, love um, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I love an old wives tale, so don't use it as an insult. <laughs> um, yeah, Danica says, why does it always feel like uphill battle? Um, you know, there was somebody saying something, if someone's sharing their reality with you, their lived experience, everything has to stop and center on that. Yeah. You know, not what they taught you in medical school. Not if, you know, not everything is there. A lot is there, but not everything. And that, that being said, and part of my work is about being trauma informed um, in understanding what is going on with the people providing care, because at the end of the day, people are going to go to the hospital to get care. And I think, I mean, we work with plenty of doulas who are also nurses. Um, I know lots of midwives. I know quite a few OBs through my family or through my network. And I think we can all recognize that the system of becoming one of those professionals is very grueling and difficult. And depending on how you're trained and your background, and your education, you probably are inheriting some fear along the way. And then if you're working in an overtaxed, overstressed, underserved, for-profit system, you're probably experiencing relational and repeated tertiary trauma Mm -hmm. um, from what's going on with the clients and what's going on between staff and the lack, lack of debrief. And if you're popping between a stillbirth and an emergency C-section and an unplanned C-section where people are scared, and then the fourth room, there's like a peaceful, uninterrupted, spontaneous labor, you might not even, as a provider, know how to hold space in that because you're so used to the sympathetic nervous system arousal right? So we have to recognize that the people delivering care are also going through the central nervous system deregulation. And most of the time they're in the stress response. And so in terms of brainwave and connection frequency, like unless they just came off a long vacation and they have really healthy boundaries and they're working in exactly the kind of space they want to work with exactly the kind of colleagues and clients that they want to serve, they're probably not going to be feeling the oxytocin and feeling that state of calm and center and connection and, and um, you know, lack of hyper rationality, analytical communication. So that is a big additional obstacle to maintaining human birth. And um, I'll be the one to try <laughs> to have compassion for that in that when we empower providers to learn about oxytocin and the central nervous system, 
we can also hopefully help them to take on some of those interpersonal changes that could make those clinical spaces safer for the people walking into them as well. That's such an important point because one of the things that I have worked really hard at all the time that I've been doula is recognizing that the OBs and nurses, they're very frightened people. They're terrified. I'm not terrified of birth. I believe in birth like I believe in God. It's unshakable. And so, but they don't, they're scared. And so when I take a deep breath and I'm grounding myself as a professional doula, I'm coming at them very compassionately. Because what, what does, happens when you're talking to a scared person? They're defending against you, mm -hmm. right? So you, you approach them and I'm always very deferential, nurse so-and-so, doctor so-and-so. And I use a, my mommy tone of voice, but not an infant, to, not making an infant out of them, but you know, sweet, nice samsara. And they're like, oh, you like that samsara I do a lot. She's so nice, good. <laughs> this, can you please do what my client <laughs> Can you please hear my client? And if their inner child can release their activation enough, you're serving your client. But if you butt heads with them, butt heads with a frightened person, they're gonna fight to the death. And if they can be transformed, uh, love will transform them. So it's an oxytocin move also. The fact that they like the doula. Well, you think about what that nice doula said, right? on behalf of my client. And if they're gonna change their mind, they might. It's happened for sure. But that it, it, oxytocin for sure is our superpower. <laughs> it really so on, that, on that note, I'd like to end with a poem by Hafiz. Um, this is a translation, sorry, I'm looking up because it's on my wall. <laughs> and I think this is a beautiful poem that reflects to me part of what it means to be a doula. Um, it's uh, translated by Daniel Gladinsky, and it's called With That Moon Language. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do not do this out loud. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. And that's called with, the moon, with This Moon Language by Hafiz. That's just beautiful. That's just beautiful. Thank you. So it's 9.02, so we're gonna wrap up. So let's give thanks to our beautiful speaker, Jessalyn. Hearts and love to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to, I want to thank the folks who are not part of our regular uh, circle time for coming and joining us. We appreciate your presence here. And love to my, my regular old doulas. Love you and I'm very happy and proud to, so, to share this space with you. Eventually, this uh, will be, this video has been recorded and it will show up on our YouTube channel, which is Better Birth TV. Please visit Better Birth TV on YouTube, subscribe and like. And eventually I'd love us to have the initial thousand viewers that we need to begin to start monetizing the work that we all do. So uh, please feel free to share this information with clients, refer to it in the future for your own work as doulas because uh, our goal at Oakland Better Birth Foundation is to help support the best birth worker posse ever here in the Bay Area and everywhere where people are helping folks have their babies. So we wanna give you the straight dope and the real deal on this work. And again, I thank Jocelyn for doing that so beautifully this evening. Thank you for having me. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Oh, you want to talk about your your uh, Hearthwell? You know? Oh, you can find my work work at hearthwell.net. Um, that's where my doula services and other events. And um, if you live in Eugene, Oregon, or nearby, birth services exist. 
Um, and I'm also a communications coordinator with OBBF. So you'll see newsletters coming out with my name on them sometimes. Um, but hearthwell.net and on Instagram, I'm uh, hearth underscore well, and I'm putting that in the chat. And you can find me on Facebook as well. And on the in this event page. <laughs> On the description for this event on YouTube, all that stuff will be information will be there there as well. Okay, so thank you. Nighty night, peace and baby bless. Good night. Good night.